Uh, so what I, what I want to do today is actually tell you why history matters at some level. Uh, I'm grateful for whoever put that plug in. That was wonderful. Uh, as a way of doing that, I want to start with this first slide of a man whom, if you don't know who he is, you should. Does anyone know who this guy is or was? It's Raphael Zahn. Does that name ring a bell? Yeah. I mean, he should be your patron saint, truly. Um, he is uh, the person who created the concept of science within the Bureau of Forestry, uh, the Office of Silvics. He would then help to found uh, Fort Valley Experimental Station. He would go on to create and establish and run the Great Lakes Experimental Station as well. He is really the central figure in defining the notion that science matters on the ground. He is effectively the person who creates the capacity for this agency to do the kind of work it has since done. Uh, he couldn't have anticipated all of the kinds of works that you people do in, in soil and water and air and geology and the like, but, but really sets the groundwork for this to happen. Science mattered, he understood, but also politics mattered. And that's something also to keep in mind. He understood that the notion of science cannot be divorced from the political context in which science operates. That's true for the agency writ large, but it was especially true he understood for science, perhaps driven out of his own life. Uh, as a young man who grew up in Tsarist Russia, it's pretty hard to avoid the political implications of that childhood. Uh, he fled there and came to the United States and entered into uh, forestry at Cornell and entered into the Forest Service at its inception, which also was a point in time in which politics mattered deeply, but it has never not mattered. And I think that's part of his claim to fame for us is the way in which he pulls these two things together because he understood, as did Pinchot, as did that first cohort, that what they were proposing to do, whether it's to manage land by whatever means or also through scientific methods, what they were proposing was intensely radical, was revolutionary in the United States. And I want to show you why they, why they felt that way and the ways in which they then pursue this kind of revolutionary agenda over time. To do that, I want to work through a series of slides that represent a reality that they thought existed. I don't think it actually did, but that's actually immaterial. Things perceived as real are real and their consequences, and they're going to have some consequences, as we will see. These three slides that I want to show you, starting in 1620, 1850, and then 1920, reflecting what, for many of that first cohort, and actually the first maybe generation or two of the Forest Service, presumed that it happened in the United States over that 300-year period, helps us understand what they saw in the land around them. So let's start with 1620. Let's assume that what they understood is reasonably accurate. It's actually not. There's not levels of this kind of virgin forest left. It's actually second, maybe even third growth in some respects. But that notwithstanding, if they saw that world in the 1620s, those Puritans who popped off of the Mayflower, and if you were a Puritan popping off of the Mayflower, and that's the world you thought you had seen, what do you know? It's actually not a rhetorical question. <laughs> I know it's 8 o'clock in the morning. It's very early to think, but this is California, so for wherever you come from, it's early or later still. Uh, so what do you know? It's an unlimited resource but also set it up against where they came from. It's not just that it's unlimited. If you came from England in 1620, what's the England you left behind? Deforested, crowded. And now you're getting to a place that's not only, as best you know, doesn't have very many people, and thank your pathogens for that. <laughs> but this looks like a resource that is infinite. It scares the hell out of you, by the way. For those of you who've read The Scarlet Letter, all sorts of interesting things happen in the woods, not all of them good. <laughs> but nonetheless, you've got this resource that is going to sustain you if you actually know what to do with it. So part of the issue is what they're coming towards to, for, to see. And then if you push it out a mere 230 years, what's happened? I mean, that's a long time. So two things, one of which is what happened, the other of which what has not yet happened. The West, absolutely, still uncut. Where else is uncut? The South, the Great Lakes. So how do we explain the places that have not yet been harvested? They haven't gotten there yet. 
If you look at those mountains, if you look at the Great Lakes, I mean, if you think about the Great Lakes and those extraordinary pine forests, they would have loved to have had them. What's the dilemma? Transportation. There's no way to get that great wood to where it's going to be consumed, which is the East Coast. It just doesn't going to happen. You can push it all you want to Buffalo, and there that mule of Sal, you know, on the Erie Canal. But she's not going to take that stuff. It's just not going to move. So it's going to be left there until the railroad arrives, until there's a way by which to move this, this natural resource to market. And if you look at northern Maine or you look at the Appalachians, the story is the same. You can cut in some places, but there's a lot of places you can't. So let's turn to the places that have been cut. Why there? Hmm? Population centers. So how do population centers account for massive harvesting along the eastern seaboard in particular? What's the mechanism by which they did it? Rivers meaning what? You can move it. You can move this stuff. Keep in mind that human beings are very lazy. If we can figure out a way by which to have some other energy push something for us, then we're going to do it. You're not going to do it in the Appalachians because that's too complicated, but you will push it in another way. But how are they using the wood? I mean, give me, shout it out. What are they doing? Buildings, ships, firewood, clearing land for? For crops, for agriculture. It's a very aggressive agriculture. Agriculture is an invasive species. It has to be. It has to fundamentally transform the landscape before you can actually do this. So one of the things is we're looking at this and we're thinking, how else are they going to heat their homes that are built out of wood but using wood to consume? The city of Philadelphia in the 1820s was consuming annually 17 square miles of forest solely to burn as heat energy and blow the smoke out the chimney. One of the ways to look at this in another sense is to go look at historic photographs of American cities well up through the 19th century. Don't look at anything else but the chimneys and count the number of chimneys. It's astonishing. For those of you who've been to Raleigh, Durham and seen the old tobacco sheds, which are still there, just count those chimneys and you realize what happened to the Appalachians. You grew tobacco in the, in the, in the Piedmont areas and in the lowlands, and you brought the other resource down to dry it so that you could produce this, this evil weed uh, that made a ton of money. So that we've got some very interesting situations that are unfolding in this landscape that are being transformed in a way, but not to the degree, not with the speed, and not with the, the sort of energy that created this world a mere 70 years later. So what's the difference between 1620 and 1850, and 1850 and 1920? The railroads, but let's like take the railroads as symptomatic of what? An industrialization. It is the marker, and there's lots of ways to do that. If you just take what the kind of natural resources that a railroad has to have to operate, start with the rail tie. How many rail ties per mile? A bunch. Excellent. Well, good answer, especially at 8 o'clock in the morning. Because who knows, really? It's 1,800, roughly. But that's almost not important until you ask another question, which is how long do they last untreated? Not very long, two to five years. So imagine building the Union Pacific. Hammer, 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 hammer as you're working your way across the United States. What has to happen behind you as you go west? Somebody has to be hammering new ones in as you put in further ones out. I mean, it becomes a very important argument. Something like billions of board feet went into rail ties before 1900. It's the Forest Service that invents the notion that you can soak those things into creosote. You're using science to extend the capacity of this economy to sustain itself, to produce that new kind of uh, rail system, the likes of which the world had never seen, and logically so. If you think about those resources in another way, it's not just wood, but you need coal to create the iron, the rails, and you're getting the coal from all sorts of places, but how is the coal going from wherever it's mined, West Virginia, Pennsylvania, the South, and other places, to where it's going to be smelted in Pittsburgh and Homestead, Pennsylvania, on rail lines? So all of this has to happen simultaneously. The iron ore itself is coming out of the Mesabi Range in northern Minnesota. How is it getting there? It has to be pulled out through mines of the like. Coal is being now mined five miles below ground. If you want to survive, what do you better do with those mine shafts? Shore them up. With what? Timber. Where are you going to get that from? That explains the far west. 
Well, how are you going to get the timber from the far west to these eastern mines? Railroads. I mean, all of this has to happen simultaneously or none of it takes off. The key thing to understand about an industrial revolution, wherever it is, is that it doesn't always happen in places because they can't put the pieces together at the exact same moment. So that exact same moment, it turns out, begins in the 1850s. If we had not had the Civil War in which we decided to murder one another at extraordinary rates, we would have had an industrial revolution a lot faster because it was starting to take off and it stops because of the Civil War to pick up later and then absorb millions of people into the United States to come into those massive cities that are exploding in size, New York, Boston, Philadelphia, and the like, which is only going to increase the appetite for wood, push those markets in ways that they have never experienced before, and really fundamentally reorder the way Americans think about their lives. But if you take these three slides together, 1620, 1850, and 1920, and not ask a historical set of questions about them, but actually what they must have represented to people, we can have two precisely opposite ways of thinking about those, those three set of slides. One is that it represents progress. Going from black to white, in effect, represents a kind of progress, the likes of which, frankly, the world had not witnessed before. The United States went from, let's be generous, a 10th rated power in the 1780s to the world's most powerful nation within 140 years. By 1920, the United States currency was the world's currency. We were the creditor nation of the globe. We had an empire, and you may not think owning Guam makes you an empire, but it does. <laughs> Cuba and the Philippines help, but Guam is really the keystone species of this whole process. We have an empire, we have a powerful economy, and you can go back through those slides and say, I know how it happened. It's because we had these natural resources, wood most especially, that allowed this transformation to come forward. What's the other way of looking at it? More our language than theirs. An ecological disaster. If one's progress, one is decline. And you could hold both opinions simultaneously as we see. In fact, they're able to do something that we tend not to be able to do, which is to see these things as parts of a whole, that these were, in fact, woven in together, which raises then the question of a series of photographs coming again out of the Forest Service archives. Why would the Forest Service take this photograph of Michigan in 1910 or this photograph of Colorado in 1915? Accomplishment <laughs> reports. <laughs> This is uh, credibility and accountability. Is that what this is? Something like that? Right. <laughs> Two. Why? Why do you want to scare people? Right. Because this is of industrial practices run amok. They took out the land. They took out the trees. And what didn't happen? Nothing rebounds. The forest doesn't regenerate. And if you go back to this previous one of Michigan, the goal was to take out the wood. And like every other state in the country, then what gets applied to the ground? Plow. I don't see any furrows because the soil is awful. It's not going to work. And the logic of the argument for the Forest Service early in its tenure is that it needs to make these claims and make them visual. The real genius, I think, of Gifford Pinchot was not that he was a forester. He actually wasn't very well trained. But he understood the modern world before it actually becomes the modern world, which is that the camera is more important than anything else. And GIS and all of the things that we have developed since that point are only building on that larger argument, that the visual, the image, is very, very powerful. And so he instructed people, as he did himself, carry a camera everywhere. Take these photographs because they become weapons in a larger argument that we need to make with a public that doesn't know why we need to exist. But to get to the point where you can see these pictures as ways of, of knowing a landscape and of pursuing a new kind of political agenda begs a question. How do they know, that is the they, the Gifford Pinchos of that generation, how do they know that this is actually an argument that one can make and it's an argument that will take that people will be compelled by it and, 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 in fact, influenced by it. To understand that, you have to get 
behind the photograph, in effect, to look at the images and what those images help us understand because they're tied to an intellectual history, a cultural history of, of some import. And it is imported, by the way. This is a European conception that a series of people, and Pinchot's last in the line, in effect, of this process, who bring these ideas across, a kind of technological transfer that takes place beginning in the 1860s and the 1870s. This photograph is of a, um, the Forestry Pavilion in the 1870s uh, Paris Exposition, to which the United States sent a series of commissioners, one of whom was a guy by the name of F.P. Baker from Nebraska. And his job was to go to the forestry pavilion and write a report about European forestry, about which he knew virtually nothing. And he was blown away when he went in here because he saw what the French were beginning to do. The French had done, the Germans were doing, the Swiss had done, the English were also doing in India. All sorts of things are starting to happen in which it's becoming clear that you can actually manage landscapes if you have the political power and jurisdiction to do so. The problem always was for Americans, and it still is troubling to us today, is that to do that, you have to have political sovereignty granted to you that European states had out of monarchies and even the Napoleonic Re uh, Republic had that the United States had not yet developed. So to have the idea is one thing. You have to create the political culture that embraces that idea, and that's an entirely different game. But the notion starts here. It also begins to evolve because of George Perkins Marsh a brilliant writer who happened to be a diplomat stationed in uh, the Mediterranean basin during the Civil War, so he had a great posting. And he spent a lot of time touring the Mediterranean. And I think there's a relationship between the bloodshed and the destruction that he heard about while he was in, in, in Europe and what he started to look that had already long happened in the European landscape. And what he saw in Italy, in Greece, in Turkey, and in Lebanon were despoiled landscapes in which the natural resources had been destroyed at some, or consumed, let's argue, but consumed to such an extent that it was unsustainable. And so he looked at Greece, saw very few trees. He saw a grazed over landscape, but very few trees. There were no cedars of Lebanon. Turkey, a former empire, had basically collapsed. The Romans, long gone. And he made a creative leap. The leap was, there's a relationship between resources and civilization. And if you can't hold the two together, you can't have either one of them. And he makes this leap because he grew up in Vermont, which is an odd connection, but you have to follow me on this one. It's a small state, but it, met, it loomed large in his head. Because when he grew up in Vermont in the 1820s and 30s, and he talks about this to a degree in his book called Man and Nature, his father would take him fishing. Only his father would explain to him why, in fact, there were no fish in the river. Because by the late 18th century, Vermont was like England 150 years earlier, totally deforested. And you would talk to him about the stream and then say, look at the hill. And that's the thing that you have to understand. There are no trees. The silt rolls. The erosion happens. It fills up those rivers. We can't find fish. So as Marsh tours the Mediterranean, he makes this connection between what he saw on the ground in terms of what had happened in the European world and what he thinks is coming to the United States. And so his book, Man and Nature, poses for us the language that we still use. The language is twofold. First of all, the apocalypse is coming. But if he left it there and simply said the apocalypse is coming, what's going to happen to his readership? It's hopeless. What are you going to do? The apocalypse is coming. Just forget about it. So you can't do it. You can't leave it there. You have to say there's a way out of the apocalypse. And what his argument is, is stewardship, his word. We are human beings. We make terrible mistakes. We know what other people have made mistakes. We can see it all around us. So let's not make those mistakes. And how do we not make those mistakes? We act differently. Let's deal with our natural resources in a different fashion. That becomes crucial in a lot of directions, as we will see, but one piece of which is really crucial in this respect. Gifford Pinchot was given that book when he was 21 years old in a grand ceremony in his family's home. It was given to him, and it becomes, in effect, his Bible. The agency that will come out of that book, in truth, is the Forest Service that will use the language of apocalypse, remember those slides from Michigan and Colorado, and argue that there's another way to operate 
through stewardship of land and resources. And it really comes out of George Perkins Marsh's There's another who makes these same claims, George Bird Grinnell. If you don't know who he is, you should know that he's one of the central figures in the, in the salvation of the Yellowstone National Park. He is the first creator of the Audubon Clubs of the United States, Glacier Park also. He was editor and publisher of a magazine called Forest and Stream. If that sounds familiar, it should, because it's the precursor of Field and Stream. And in Forest and Stream in 1882, he boiled down Marsh to this wonderful little phrase that still is very effective. No woods, no game. No woods, no water. No water, no fish. It's not bad. Six words. Kind of works pretty well. And the argument he is making is not to the readers of Marsh's book, but in fact, the readers of his magazine, who belong to rod and gun clubs all over the United States, energizing that volunteer grassroots movement that had begun to emerge in the 1830s, arguing to them, habitats matter for the things that matter to you. And if you continue to slaughter animals at the rate you're doing, and the passenger pigeon becomes one of the literal marker species of this process, then it will not be possible for you to pass along those traditions to your children. It simply won't happen. And so where Marsh can give us the broad vision, it's Grinnell that starts to put these things to play in politics, to inject them into the public discourse and the debate about what the United States should and should not do in the late 19th century. And the way I know this stuff actually matters is you go to the comics. Because the moment you go from a text into the thing that everybody actually reads, then you know something's happened. Now you don't know, and I have no idea whether this cartoonist who's doing this thing when the forests are exhausted, um, actually read Marsh. I suspect not. I hope not, actually, because what it really means is the ideas have become so commonplace that they're just out there, and you grab them and hold on to them. So when the forests are exhausted on the left, Christmas trees will look like metallic things, which actually they do, right? <laughs> St. Louis will be a disaster because the Mississippi will have dried up. Keep in mind, George Bird Grinnell, no woods, no water. Des Moines will become a desert. Actually, Des Moines is a desert. <laughs> Memphis will become a ruin again. But the worst possible imagined response is the last right-hand corner of this. There's a vessel that is arriving in New York Harbor from Europe full of wood. Why is that the death blow to the American Republic? It's still associated with Europe, and now we're colonials again. It's only been 100 years of our liberation, and now we're dependent upon them for the very thing that we used to send to them all of the time. Now, because they have forestry, they can send us wood. It's terrifying to them, so much so uh, that you get this pithy comment about what's actually going to happen if we run out of it, and that it is Uncle Sam's likeness, a la Samson. You get deep into their sort of psychological and sexual worries. They need Viagra. There is this, I mean, this is a deep-seated fear. And understand why. This cartoon came out in 1908. At the point at which the United States felt itself to be at the cusp of world dominance, why are they worried about losing their forests? What does it signify to them but an opportunity lost? And they're reading Marsh, even though I suspect they're not reading Marsh. They're seeing this world in a, in a way that terrifies them, however true or untrue it may be. So what we get to see is that there is a legislative reaction to all of this energy and discussion about conservation. Congress is not proactive. I know that's a real shock to you. <laughs> they react to pressure. And whether they read Marsh or not, almost as immaterial, because Marsh is quoted in the congressional record. 
Whether they saw these various cartoons or not actually doesn't matter, because clearly there is being pressure placed upon them. And the way you know that is you go through the legislative record. They never talked about trees before the Civil War. After the Civil War, they can't stop talking about them. So something has happened. And the conversation, you know, they don't pass these bills, mind you, but they get routed through committees. Well, they've never been through committees before because no one had thought that that was actually an issue one had to deal with. Go back to the 1620s. The notion is that it's inexhaustible. But if you start to talk about their exhaustibility, then you've, you've, there's a tipping point that's taken place sometime in the 1870s when this process begins to unfold. Within 20 years, there is legislation that does make it through Congress that creates a radical and revolutionary new conception, which is that public lands, or some of them, must be held in public hands, controlled by a new branch of government, or at least a, a, a newly invented uh, agency in time, so that you can argue that there is now a map, a map that has blotches on it, and we'll call these blotches forest reserves, that they're not going to be given away. We will regulate them, we will manage them, all sorts of things are going to happen, but they will never be sold. Keep in mind why this is revolutionary. Since 1620, the public domain was something that the government, over time, wanted to get rid of every single acre. And now this generation is saying, no. There are some acres that are not going to go down that route. There are some acres that must be controlled. And in fact, the acreage is going to grow. From 1898, when Pinchot entered into the, Bureau, the Division of Forestry, soon to be the uh, Bureau of Forestry, to uh, 1907, when the National Forests now are named National Forests, there is this radical shift in how the government begins to imagine this landscape. And a way of thinking about it, if you take those first three slides, 1620, 1850, 1920, and you're moving from black to white, and although the color scheme doesn't quite work in this case, what we're trying to do with these forests is to move from white to black and to move the story forward in a different direction. But to do that requires some nifty little tricks, creating cool hats <laughs> and guys to fill them with snappy uniforms and a book, a good book, the use book. It's a little smaller than the today's current version. <laughs> but it assumes certain things. Why the hat? Authority. Authority. Why is that hat more authoritative than a baseball cap, sort of today's model? Well, it is about military. These are actually invented before the war. But why does the military have more authority than a baseball cap? Because they carry guns. Excellent. <laughs> They're packing heat. That's what this is really about. They're symbols laid within symbols in that respect. They've got the hat. They've got the uniform. It carries authority. And for those of you who wear those uniforms periodically, when people come to talk to you because you're wearing a uniform, what do they assume? You're in charge, but what else? You know something. <laughs> it may be true. <laughs> it's a trick that academics know real well. It's called a tie. So we fake out our students every day. But it assumes you've got an expertise that they don't have. But to convey that expertise requires also that book and the education that these guys have, not just to read that book, but to be able to manage it. There are no forestry schools in the United States. You have to create those. And so Pinchot took $250,000 of his inheritance. We all should have this ability. Gave it to Yale, said create a forestry school. They do. All graduate students, and that's the vast bulk of us, I suspect, in this room, ultimately go through these processes. And to get out on the other side, meaning you're a profession, a professional, means you belong to what? The club. The society, created in Gifford Pinchot's living room, the Society of American Foresters. It becomes a licensing process so that you know what a forester is and what a forester isn't. And keep in mind, this is consistent culturally with every single profession in the United States at the exact same time. The American Chemical Association, the American Historical Association, the American Bar Association, all of them are being created within a 30-year period. And they're doing the exact same thing. It's at that moment in which doctors say, I'm a doctor, you're a midwife, and you don't handle obstetrics. 
And you start to separate who's who and what's what, who's professional and who we now call a quack. Because you can do that because they haven't been to your school. They've been to another school or not to school at all. And these guys become emblematic of that bigger process that's churning its way through American culture that argues that expertise is critical to understanding anything, and in this case, certainly, what these guys want to do, which is to manage land. But it turns out, and you won't be surprised by this, the real issue is not managing land, it's managing people. So you got the cool hat and the great uniform, and you're riding down the western slope in Colorado. And you encounter Fred Light, who's just run 500 head of cattle onto what is now, we will call, national forest land. And you say, Fred, move. What does Fred do? <laughs> pulls out his gun. So if Fred pulls out his gun, or not, since we assume Fred is a pacifist, not true, but, but let's just assume that for a second, then what do you do? Pull out the book. But Fred, you can't be here. It says so right here. Fred doesn't care, so you sue him. Why? Why do you go to court? This is not something the agency is really interested in nowadays, but back then they are. Set a precedent. You can have all the good books you want. They mean absolutely nothing until they've gone through the court system. And there are rumors that the Forest Service is encouraging Fred and Peter Grimond and other people who got sued to do what they were doing so that they could get the test cases they needed because the test cases are going to provide ultimately the crucial legal jurisdiction, the sovereignty over that land. The uniform is good, the hat's nice, the book is great. Law is crucial. And they won every single one of those lawsuits, 10 of them, between 1905 and 1912. And that's the legal basis by which you all do the work you do on the lands that you uh, supervise and oversee. That then raises questions also about what and how to think about land. Because now you've got these maps. Now you have these people. But let's suppose Helen Dow, sitting up here, sees a fire. How does she tell somebody in some distant place where that fire is? Well, but, but what does that mean? The heliograph. And that other person knows what those signals are. You can say it's here, and you can give either by number or by some kind of designation where it is. You've thought about the land in a new way. It's not a, just a ridge line. It's a particular ridge line and a particular place in that ridge line. We're starting to survey this land in new fashion so that you could put this guy on his horse with his hat. And because this is American culture, you know he is looking west. over this vast expanse of land, and at least theoretically, what do we know? He thinks. He knows what he's doing. He's in control. He's in charge, as this is designed to suggest. Well, it turns out the West doesn't actually think that way about what it is that the agency was doing. They think, rather, that the moment you articulate on maps and lines and hats and books is what you're really doing is shutting out people from these resources and these landscapes. And they feel that way because they've been able to trespass all they wanted before, and now they have to pay for that service. Pinchot on a brucking, bucking bronco trying to break the West is going to fail. And we know he's going to fail because the hat he's wearing has no authority in the West. A Panama hat, please. What does it signify? He's an East Coast dude. He doesn't know nothing. So why should we listen to him? Or better yet, the logic is also, please note the teeth, that really what's at stake here is a new kind of federal sovereignty being manifest by Teddy Roosevelt's impress, literally impressed into the land of Colorado, that the executive branch, through the agency, through the Forest Service, is enacting power it never had before. And in this case, the West is absolutely right. What Roosevelt and Pinchot and others are effectively doing is creating the modern presidency. Roosevelt, it is, who named the White House the White House because he wanted a visual representation of the presidency. The Forest Service becomes a real representation of that authority in landscapes where that authority had been missing, except for the military, and that's only sort of temporary and episodic. That's why, in effect, the West is responding in the ways they did, and certainly with this one, a cartoon Pinchot loved. Tsar Pinchot and his Cossack Rangers. Little did you know that's how you were thought of. Or maybe, actually, it's not all far off the mark. <laughs> With whips in their hand, and in the foreground, if you can see it, 
Westerners on a single knee, not two knees, otherwise that's a prayerful mode, abjecation. You are, you are deferring to the power of the executive branch, constructing a new perception of what's happening that Pinchot, frankly, disagreed with. The soft hat for him was, in fact, the hat that Forrester's wore and the scientists wore in this process. Why? Because for the vast bulk of the, histories, the agency's history up through the 1940s, you could wear a soft hat because very little trees are coming down. It's the custodial world that they were interested in. And part of that custodial effort, as it was in Colorado in the 1915 period, was equally true in the South in the 1930s. When the Dust Bowl rips through the erosion that tears apart that southern landscape, um, it's the Forest Service that goes and begins to replant, in this case, Arkansas. But it could have been Mississippi. It could have been Alabama. It could have been the Tennessee River Valley. It could have been any place. I met a, a forester three weeks ago up in Missoula who joined the agency in 1933. He estimated he had planted a million trees in his career. Now, give him some exaggeration. He's 92 even if it's only half a million trees. That's a hell of a lot of trees. And he effectively was arguing that that's what his work was, is to restore those landscapes in a way that would have done Marsh proud, and certainly from that agency's point of view, uh, testifies to its larger history. The hard hat goes on in the 1950s. That's when the agency's timber cutting becomes uh, much larger. This is from the Bitterroot in the late 60s. But it could have been the Gifford Pinchot National Forest outside of Vancouver, Washington. It could have been the Monongahela in West Virginia, where the ultimate lawsuit emerges that will force the agency to begin to change its way. And the process of this unfolding suggests a series of questions, not least of which is, what's the wood for? Now, one of the reasons is that much of the private timberland had already been cut. And so what's left is national forests, a reserve that had done its job, in effect. It's going into the home building world of the 1950s and 60s. And this is my favorite. It's so aesthetic. <laughs> Levittown. I mean, it's a really fun place. Um, but it, that raises then another question that's also very cultural. If you lived here or any place like there, and God knows there were lots of places like this, where would you go to recreate? Not there the national forests, let's just say. So if the place you go to helped to create the house you live within, what's the dilemma? It's shrinking, and you're confronted directly with the consequence of your own consumption. And I think that's one of the cultural tensions that emerges in the 1950s and early 1960s around the relationship between what we consume in terms of home building, what we wish to consume in recreation. And there's a clash between those things that ripples through the culture in a variety of fashions that raises any number of questions, but some of which need to be answered through a series of maps. Because that paradox has not disappeared. It's actually only extended and become more intense. So let me use a series of maps. I have to do this linearly. Forgive me. It really should be sort of laid on top of one another. Uh, but I can't quite do that. So let's start with roads. If you look at roads in the 1930s, basically the main highway system in the United States, why is it where it is? It's where the population is. Keep that in mind. The relationship between roads, like railroads, has to be related to the populations that are going to use them. So what does that mean 40 years later when we have a road network like this? We're everywhere. OK. But more especially, given where we started in 1930, where are the roads really now? to the woods in the south and in the west. So let's follow that story in another direction and ask a, another question. If people are connected to roads in some fundamental fashion, then one of the things we need to think about, and it's hard to see on this map, but just go with the darker colors. What that reflects is the population shift in the United States between 1950 and 1990. Where are we going? South and west. And even Alaska, if you look in the bottom lower corner, its numbers are nothing like the other places, but it's perfectly in line with the broader transition uh, that's taking place in the United States, which can be 
better reflected, I think, in these figures. The West of the United States between 1970 and 1990 grew from 35 million to 53 million. The South from 63 million to 85 million. And if you look at the Middle West and the Northeast, they grew by 2 to 3 million alone. They basically flatline over 20 years when the surge of population is rolling south and west. Take a map of the United States, tilt it south and west, and basically people are falling down. They're moving. And the roads reflect that, but those roads are built by what? How are those roads built? Federal dollars. Watch the federal dollars, because that becomes a critical part of the story when we ask another question. Who are those people that are moving? Elderly. OK. So what do they take with them? What federal dollars do they take with them? Pensions, Social Security, Medicare. Ask yourself why all of the HMO headquarters in the United States are in the American South. And you've just answered your question. There's pools of resources. Capital now has shifted. The second most important uh, financial capital in the United States today is Charlotte, North Carolina. Who knew? But it is because of that transformation that has taken place. And that poses a very serious dilemma for any agency, let alone this one. Because if you're starting to move people south and west in vast numbers, and in 1950 there was one western city on the 10 largest cities in the United States, and that's LA. Today, six of nine of the largest cities in the United States are Houston, San Antonio, and Dallas, San Diego, Phoenix, and LA, and note what's not on the list, SeaTac, Portland, Salt Lake City, Las Vegas, Tucson, the Bay Area. You start adding those numbers together, and it raises another really interesting dilemma, which is put all of those maps together and then drop the final map of the National Forest System on top of it. And we've got people where forests are. That was never the expectation in the early part of the 20th century. It couldn't possibly be. Pinchot and Zahn and others grew up in a world in which 100 million was a lot of people. Well, we're bucking up against 300 million. And it's not just the numbers. It's where they are and where their economies are. Because the national economy now is being driven by a service industry that is largely located in the south and west a medical industry that is largely located in the south and west, a computer industry and its affiliates that are largely south and west. So why won't more people move to the south and west? Well, of course they are. So the dilemmas that are now confronted today are only going to be escalating over time. And the key, in a sense, but again, this is only a kind of estimation of those processes. You put fire into this picture or put water shortages into this picture. And living in San Antonio, let me tell you, this is a, this is a critical issue. That line is important not because it's fire unto itself, but because it's a fire in a national forest next to a suburb. Add one final piece, which in November 2nd we'll also learn more about, <laughs> which is politics. Getting back to the politics that Zahn and Pinchot well understood. If everybody's moving south and west, what do they take with them? Their vote. And those votes combined create electoral votes. And those electoral votes make this picture all the more important and all the more tense. Those powers aren't disappearing. The capacity for that suburbanite in that house to pick up the phone and call his or her representative and say, get this damn thing out, means that budgets are going to shift relative to those political pressures. Again, remember, it's not a proactive institution, Congress. It's reactive. And it's going to start to move in those kinds of directions because that's where the political powers are. And it's the presidency, ultimately, that will have the greatest power on that in the end. Because if you think about it, when was the last time a Northeasterner was elected president? Kennedy, 44 years ago. And if you look, with a few exceptions, at who ran and won and lost between those 44 years, almost all of them are Southerners and Westerners. That's not predictive. It is suggestive, which is why the West Wing is fiction, in case you missed that part. What it ultimately means, though, is for the Forest Service, which has had to evolve over time in response to a variety of pressures, is now going to have to respond to a new series of pressures that have been manifest before, but I think that manifestation is only going to intensify over time. Because I think this is the new map of what any 
agency, any regulatory body must now confront. It's a new nation with a new set of problems that requires a new kind of agency mandate. Thank you very much.